Mantor Ministries presents the Mantor Guy Podcast. We may talk about football. We could mention bacon. We might reference Rocky movies. We'll probably discuss the Mantor conferences, but we'll definitely talk about how to grow in our walk with God. Here's your host, the Mantor Guy, Jamie Holden. Hey guys, welcome back to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Jamie Holden here. Thanks so much for taking time to listen this week. Today I am so happy to share with you the third session message from our 2021 Northeast PA Mantor. Pastor Rodney Murphy, the lead pastor at Faith Assembly in Hazleton, PA, shared about the need for God's men to get their priorities straight and make time for the things that truly matter in life. It was an amazing challenge that the men really responded to, and we wanted to share it with you this week. So enjoy this message from Pastor Rodney, and allow the Holy Spirit to challenge you as you listen. Good to have you here uh, once again. Thank you for sticking around. Um, that's why I gave you free gifts. We'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, it is not to belt your pastor with on Sunday mornings when he goes too long. I mean, if you do it, you, you didn't get it from me, all right? You didn't get it from me. But, you know, sometimes they say, uh, you know, they save the best for last. That's not true in any way today. I can guarantee you that because we've had two tremendous speakers. Uh, they've done a phenomenal job. And I want to just say how proud I am of all you men. Man, taking a Saturday away uh, from the busyness of life, uh, from all the honey-do lists that your wife's had for you, your brave men, uh, to come out and to, to be a part of, uh, what God's doing through the mentor. So thank you for being here. And uh, the good news is we're already, we're ahead of schedule, you know? So I think that's great. The bad news is I know it, and I like to speak. So uh, that really doesn't help you at all. But uh, why don't we open in prayer real quick, and let's jump into what God has for you. Heavenly Father, you are an awesome God. You're mighty, you're holy, you're perfect. Uh, you're everything that we are striving to be because you're our dad. And uh, we can't wait, Lord, to uh, uh, continue, Lord, what we've learned here today and live it out in our lives. Uh, when we get home, God, when we go to church tomorrow, when we live out our week as salt and light this week and we're in the word and, uh, Lord, we're just kind of doing the things that we've learned this week and help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Help us, Lord God, to, to live out the faith as men of God that you've developed us and called us to be. Now open our ears to hear what your spirit has to say. Open our hearts to receive. Help us to stay awake and we give you glory in all God's men say. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Now listen, on the way in, you should have received three items. You should have received your little smiley ball. You should have received uh, a, a little green devo uh, fill in the blank. Uh, and so that means you're going to need a pen. If you don't have a pen, distract your neighbor and take his, okay? Uh, whatever you need to do. You want to fill in the blanks a little bit. And then you should have received a devotional to take home uh, with you. Okay, so those are three items. If you didn't get any of those, raise your hand. The guys are ready to come to you. Raise your hand if you didn't get those. And our men, we should be getting three items to these men. All over here, we need, uh, what, a green devotional over here. All right, so while you guys are doing that, keep those hands raised. I'm going to tell you uh, that next month, I am going to be 53 years old. Can you imagine that? No. I know I look much younger than that. I appreciate that very much. And uh, yeah, June 2nd, uh, that's the first thing. Write that on your notes. Uh, and I'll give you my address so you can send me birthday cards, okay? And uh, June 2nd is my birthday. I'm going to be 53 years old. Now, what does that mean? It means that I grew up, my teenage years was in the 80s. How many know the 80s were awesome, right? The 80s were awesome. We love the 80s. And when I think about the 80s, I, you can't help. And I'm so surprised that even today, uh, kids today are listening to 80s music still. 70s and 80s music, right? It's a, yeah, the 70s were close. We'll give you the, yes, the end of the 70s. And, but, you know, when you think of the 80s, you know, and there's some of the music I, I, I didn't really care for, but some of the big superstars, uh, uh, you, you'll see like Michael Jackson, uh, Beastie Boys, Bon Jovi, Run DMC, U2, Def Leppard, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, NXS. I mean, there's tons of great bands from the 80s. On the count of three, shout out your favorite band. One, two, three. All right. And then we had, we took all that awesome music and we made something called mixtapes. How many of you made a mixtape? 
uh, somewhere in the 80s. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. Maybe it was for your sweetheart, you know, some love songs, you know, some 38 special, I don't know, uh, or whatever, you know, you kind of threw in there. Uh, uh, but you, you had to make the mi If you didn't make a mixtape in the 80s, you missed out, all right? That was part of it. How many, how many of you young people know what a tape is, a cassette tape? All right, not, not a lot. Not a lot know what that is. Uh, they also had in the 80s some great movies, Empire Strikes Back, uh, uh, Return of the Jedi, the Indiana Jones, E.T., go home, right? Uh, Back to the Future, some great movies. Then we had things like G.I. Joe. We had the Walkman. How many of you had a Walkman for your cassettes, right? Come on. You can admit it. It's all right. Uh, acid wash jeans, parachute pants, you know, Don Johnson, right? And, and, and the other uh, Miami Vice and the look of the 80s was crazy, crazy. How many of you had a fanny pack? You can admit it. It's okay. It's therapy. It's therapy. You wore a fanny pack somewhere in the 80s. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. So that's just a quick summary of the 80s. And, and in the 80s also, there was a, a, a movement that wasn't really a good movement, but it was the first time that somebody uh, classified this statement, and it be kind of caught on, and it's simply these three words in the 80s. I'm stressed out. Would you say that with me? I'm stressed out. Psychologist and professor Mark Jackson from the University of Exeter said this about the 80s. It was a disease, stress, of civilization, an epidemic caused by the relentless strain of life. And he said the only solution that people came up with in the 80s to deal with strep, to stress was just to accept it, to try to learn to deal with it, because we are a progressive society. Increasingly, people looked at stress not as a condition to eradicate, but as something to, to just learn to cope with and learn to deal with. How did they cope with it? Well, the, the professors and the leaders said that in the 80s, people sp spent countless hours watching television. You know, some of the TV shows of the 80s. Uh, they, there was a lot of withdrawing from family and friends. Uh, there was overeating. There was undereating. People were not taking care of themselves. Thanks, man. Um, people were sleeping too much. People were drinking alcohol too much. They were lashing out. There was a lot of violence, a lot of uh, uh, over uh, uh, abundance of just kind of anger issues going on because of this. Uh, people were smoking or picking up smoking as a habit or smoking more. Uh, they were taking over-the-counter drugs more than usual, sleeping pills, muscle relaxants, anti-anxiety pills. And then, of course, the, the growth of uh, the illegal drugs was uh, an unsafe drugs was on uh, just a, a pandemic. That's the 80s, stress. And that really, people say that the 80s began what we call now the era of stress. And how many know that stress hasn't gone away, right? Matter of fact, if anything, it's increased by decade, 80, 90, 2000. Now we're in the 21st century, and we're continuing to feel the stress. I don't need to tell you because we just lived the last year and a half, right? Nothing like that in our lifetimes. Nothing like that. And the stress, I used to have a full head of hair, you know, last year. It was flowing blonde. No, that's not true. It's a lie. But stress has really come at us, and stress is really uh, deepening uh, in our culture and in our society, and we are living in stress now more than ever. Now, the reason I gave you this little smiley face ball is a reminder if you get nothing else out of my message or sermon today, at least you get a prize to go home with, all right? And when you think of a bald, smiley guy, you can think of me, all right? Pray for me. A guy named Alex Carswell, he was 29 years old, and one day he got off of a, a, a confrontation with his boss on the telephone. He took the marker in his hand and threw it at a picture of his mom and her dog. And he broke the picture. But he said, you know what, something happened when I released that marker from my hand and, and I flew across the room and smashed something. He said there was something, it was like a relief, it felt good. But I knew I had to fix the picture before my mom came or I'd be in trouble. And out of that, he told the Palm Beach Post-Gazette, out of that, 
He said he came with this idea of how do we relieve stress with somebody? Man, this is the end of the 80s. It's 1988. He says, how do we help relieve stress? There was something that happened there, psychosomatic or, or, or just physiological, that when I threw that, when I had an action to my stress, it felt good. And thus begin the error that continues today of stressed balls. How many of you have some of these in your, in your house, in your office? You know, I have like five or six, you know. Because, you know, being a pastor, that's really what it's all about. It's like, Lord, you know, help me not to kill this person in Jesus' name right now. You know, because they say that when you squeeze something, right, it relieves the stress. When you, when you squeeze it, it's good for therapy. It's good for physical therapy. Physical therapists use it. Uh, there's different shapes and sizes, you know. So uh, as a pastor, one of the things I feel like, you know, one of my sayings is, uh, you know, it's better to squeeze the squeeze ball than to squeeze the, the person's neck who's sitting across from me. Because that could cause some legal issues and, I don't know, whatever, you know, the board says there. But um, I want to talk to you today about priorities. You say, well, what does priorities have to do with stress? Here's my, my submission to you. I believe that most of us are stressed here today because we don't have our priorities in line. See, we, we, we're, we are, we're, we hear the article, Tyranny of the Urgent. We live by the urgent, and we don't have our priorities in line, and therefore we're constantly living in a state of stress. And if we're going to have energy for living for God, if we're going to be men of the word, if we're going to be the salt and light that God has called us to be, it begins with getting our priorities in line. Now, this isn't going to be a, a, a step one, step two, step th three type of message. I was tempted to do that because I'm kind of OCD. I like lists. Anybody else like lists out there? I like lists. I like to check things off. But I think we have to go deeper than read my Bible, pray for 15 minutes, you know, clean up my, 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 my side of the room or whatever. You know, we, we got we to gotta move deeper than that. Because there's an issue that's deeper than that in our hearts and lives. And if we don't deal with that, then we're going to be, uh, we're going to leave here like every other honor bound, like every other mentor, like every other conference, like every other sermon. We're going to say amens, hallelujahs, let's enjoy the worship, let's have some donuts and go home and nothing's going to change in our life. It starts in Matthew 6, 33. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. This is right in your notes. Right there. It's right there. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. I want you to circle above all else. Circle those words right in the verse. Above all else. Friends, if you want to have your priorities lined up, if you want less stress in your life, if you want to walk and be the man of God that God has called you to be, and you want to be the father, and you want to be the husband, and you want to be the son, and you want to be the brother, and you want to be the leader, and you want to be the pastor, and you want to be uh, the guy that God can look to and call on, then we got to get our priorities in line. And friends, the only way to do that is if we learn to put God above all else. Our focus needs to be, first and foremost, the kingdom of God. So maybe you get on a plane to fly, uh, you know, Monday somewhere for business, and a guy next to you says, and you know they're like six feet apart or in the back of the plane, he says, listen, uh, uh, you know, you get in this conversation, and he, and he said, what did you do this weekend? He said, well, I went to this uh, crazy mentor conference, and oh, that's at a church. Yeah, he said, no, I heard something about a church. Uh, somebody once said something about the kingdom of God. I never understood that. What does that mean? To seek, above all else, the kingdom of God. What does that mean? Well, there's a lot of, if you, if you read a lot of theologians and a lot of, you know, smarter people than me, they have some really great explanations. But I, I kind of think like a man, so let me give it to you simple today. The kingdom of God is where God's will is done. The kingdom of God is where God's will is done. That's what it's all about. It's a kingdom, right? In a kingdom, there's a king. And the king says what happens in the kingdom. And whatever the king says is going to happen in the kingdom, guess what's going to happen? 
what the king says, right? It's his kingdom, right? And that's how kingdoms work. And God is the God of our kingdom, amen? amen. So God's will be done in our lives. It's God's plan. It's God's way. It's God's will because it's God's kingdom. And as brothers of God, uh, I mean, as, as brothers together in God's kingdom, right, and, and as servants of God and as friends of God, we are here to carry out the will of the Father. Amen? See, but there's been a lot of kingdom. Any history fans out here? I love history, you know. I'm working with my daughter. I did not know when my daughter went to college that I was going back to college too. Because I find myself, like, doing, doing reading assignments for her and helping her write papers Somehow she has duped me, because she's my little princess, into doing her college work for her. I don't know how that's happened. Matter of fact, I got to go home and write a paper before Monday. No, I'm, I'm serious. A six-page paper on the immigration from South America to America. And she says, Dad, it just needs to be done Tuesday. I'm like, okay, honey, whatever I can do to help you. And I'm paying for your college. How, how does this work? But you know, when there's a kingdom, the king rules. Amen. It's about the king. The magic kingdom? No. That's, that's run by liberals and LGBTQ people. But God's kingdom? It's the only kingdom. If you study history, every kingdom has fallen. Every great society, every great empire has fallen within 300 years. And guess who's next? The United States of America. And those great kingdoms haven't fallen from the outside enemies. Those great kingdoms like Rome and Greece and the Ottoman Empire, they've fallen from within. Moral decay, spiritual decay. That describes our great country. That's where we're headed. But friends, there is a kingdom that lasts forever. It's called God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. And we need to, if we're going to be men of God in these last days, if we are going to stand firm, if we are going to speak the truth, if we are going to be the salt and light, then we need to be about our Father's business. So Monday, I don't know, like, you know, I don't know if you use a, a written pl planner or a, on your phone or whatever, Monday, you look at your schedule for Monday. Maybe it looks something like this, you know, pick up the dry cleaning. Meet the boss at 11. Have lunch with my friend. Get the car washed. But today, after today, you're like, you know what? I'm going to change my priorities, man. I'm going to make God first in my life. So that maybe your schedule will look like this. Pick up the cleaning. Meet with the boss at 11. Have lunch with my friend. Change the world for God. Get my car washed. Friends, it doesn't work that way. See, that's how we think as men. That's how we think. We think, well, listen, I want God to be number one in my life. I want to live for God, so I'm going to insert him into my life. I'm going to insert him into my schedule. That's not going to stay up there, are you, little smiley face? Stay up there. Stay. All right, good. I'm going to, I'm going to add God to my schedule. And how often do we do that? I'm going to add devotions to my schedule. I'm going to add prayer time to my schedule. I'm going to add these things which are good and, and, and of, of God and for God, but, but we, we misinterpret, we misunderstand what it means to seek the kingdom of God first. We, we misunderstand. You dog, we're bad smiley face. We misunderstand when Jesus says, I am your first love. I des I'm a jealous God. You should have no other gods before me, right? Because, friends, listen, here's the deal. And I love the quote earlier uh, that Dwayne put up. You know, basically you're either dying in your sin or you're dead to your sin, right? Friends, how many know there's no gray areas in the kingdom of God? You're either for him or you're against him. You're either in or you're out. And that's why people hate Christianity so much because there's no gray areas. You're either with God or you're against God. But thank God for his grace, amen? So where is the challenge come? How do I get my priorities straight? How do, how do I get my life lined up? Jesus says in Matthew 3, verse 2, this is from God's word. It says, turn to God and change the way you think and act. Because the kingdom of heaven is near. 
Oh, that's good, brothers. That's good. Turn to God. Change the way you think and act because the kingdom of heaven is near. I want you to circle the word change. And I want you to circle the phrase turn to God. Turn to God and change. Circle that in your notes. Because, friends, listen, I need to change the way I think and I act. It's not about rearranging my schedule. It's not about, well, I'm just going to refocus my life. I'm going to add God to my already busy schedule. I'm going to add church. I'm going to add ministry. I'm going to add, you know, going to men's conferences. Friends, when you just add extra things to your life, guess what? It doesn't make you more godly. It just makes you more tired and more worn out and more wiped out. So the enemy has even a greater opportunity and a greater uh, chance to get into your tired and run down and weary life and bring temptation and struggle and, and agony and misery to your life. And then you go to your men's leader and say, yeah, but I was at the conference and I told God I was going to pick him first and I began to do all these things. Friends, it goes deeper than that. There's got to be a change in your heart. There's got to be a change in your life. It goes way beyond your schedule. It goes way beyond your career. It goes way beyond your hobbies. It goes way beyond your marriage. It goes way beyond your children. It goes deep to the core of every man, which is was mentioned earlier, that you need to sell your soul out completely to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because until you do that, that temptation, the schedule, the craziness of this world will distract you you know, and you know what the word busy means, right? Being under Satan's yoke. That's the acronym for busy. Being under Satan's yoke. There needs to be a change in our hearts. And this is the message that really needs to be received by the church today and by Christians today. Because there's a lot of people sitting in our churches who, when they face before God, are not going to get the words, well done, my good and faithful servant, enter in. We know about the parable of the sheep and goats, right? And they're going to be maybe shocked or surprised, but not really. Because, friends, you're, you've either repented and changed your way and changed your life and made God the purpose for everything, or you haven't. Now, there is a process in that. You know, you don't become instantaneously the perfect man. But we need to be daily What's Paul say? Dying to ourselves so that we can change. That means every day when I get up, before, and this is a practice that I've been doing for years, before my feet hit the bed, you know, and I kick my wife out to make me breakfast. No, I, I don't do that. She's, she's already up before me going. But, you know, before I get out of bed, first thing in my mind that comes to my mind is, God, thank you for a new day. I'm so happy that I'm breathing today. Help me not to screw up like I did yesterday. Help me, help me to do, help me to be in the center of your will in everything that I do today. And when I do fail you, thank you for your grace and mercy and let me press on towards the prize which you've given me. Something like that. Every day, I start my day focused on God, your first. Guys, we'll be back with the remainder of this message right after the break. I know you're going to dig this. Like what you're hearing? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thanks. Men of God, we can't keep burning daylight. It's time to rise and shine. Mantor Ministry presents Burning Daylight, the Godly Man's Call to Rise and Shine. This is the most important book we've released yet as we give a rallying cry to God's men to throw off all complacency and rise and shine. This book is designed to help you know what you believe, why you believe it, and how to recognize the false teaching of progressive Christianity so you don't fall into its trap. It's time we rise from our beds and shine bright to a dark world. Order your copy today at mantorministries.com slash burningdaylight. No more burning daylight, men. It's time to rise and shine. Don't forget to visit iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Thanks. Hey, guys. Jimmy Holden here, the mentor guy. And you know, so often men tell me that they can't afford to use covenant eyes. And my immediate response back is, dude, you can't afford not to use covenant eyes. For 53 cents a day, you can protect 
every computer, every laptop, every tablet and cell phone that you and your family own from the trap of internet pornography. I tell them for 53 cents a day or $16 a month, you can make sure your little girls never stumble onto pornography as she uses Snapchat or does any internet searches while doing her homework. For 53 cents a day, you can make sure your son never falls into the trap of pornography or even sees it accidentally while online. I say for 53 cents a day, you can protect your wife from getting trapped in the trap of internet porn and protect your marriage. And I tell them for 53 cents a day, you can help break the cycle of internet pornography that's been holding in your life. Guys, you and your family, and most importantly, your walk with God, cannot afford for you not to use Covenant Eyes. So, head to MantorMinistries.com and hit the Covenant Eyes button in the upper right-hand corner to get one month of free service. Try it out. I know you're going to love it. You're never going to regret it. Guys, do it today. You can't afford not to have Covenant Eyes be a part of your life. Listen to the Mantor Guy podcast on the go via Apple Podcast and Google Play. Thanks. Hey guys, Jamie Holden here. Did you know that only 10% of churches have a healthy, thriving men's ministry? That's only one out of 10 churches. Well, my mission is to see this number become 100%. Join me in my work with HEUS Missions to help develop men's ministry in the local church. Become a monthly financial investor in the work God called me to do by going to mentorministries.com slash partner and clicking on the Give Online button. Together, we can see God continue to move among men. The Mentor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God. Guys, we have something brand new for you as we head into 2021. For the first time ever, Mantor Ministries has put together a one-year Bible reading plan called Burning Daylight. This 365-day Bible reading plan will consist of six days of Bible reading specifically planned for men and one day of a devotional each week for all 52 weeks of the year. It is completely free. You can sign up for this daily Bible reading plan at mantorministries.com slash Bible plan today. It's time we know what we believe as men of God and we develop our convictions and these convictions are developed through God's word. And to develop these convictions, you gotta know what the Bible says. So sign up today for our free one year Bible reading plan, Burning Daylight at mantorministries.com Bible plan. That's mantorministries.com slash Bible plan. Welcome back to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Welcome back as we continue listening to this powerful message. We need a change of heart. And when you begin to ask God to change your heart, things like this will happen. That temptation that used to hold you back, and you, the, the one that you come to every men's conference and you pray over, and you pray about your anger, uh, the sexual immorality in your life, you know, the, uh, uh, just your, your, your thought life, whatever it is, you know, the works, whatever it is that you continue to lay before the Lord, when you really submit your heart to God and you put him as the first priority, one day you're going to wake up and boom, that's going to be gone. I believe it. It pains my heart to watch men struggle day after day, year after year uh, with the same sin issue. I'm not saying that there aren't weaknesses in our life, but guess what? The Word of God says in our weakness, He will be strong, right? He's our strength. So if I'm going to try to overcome that temptation, that sexual sin, uh, that uh, over-drinking, or whatever it is that's in my life, it's not because of who I am, it's because of who He is, Right? It's because of who we, so I got to come. I got to have a change of heart. And I believe that God can take that temptation and that sin away. Amen. Maybe you have a, maybe you've been looking at the world through bitter eyes, ungrateful eyes. You're tired of uh, the administration. You're tired of the government. You're tired of the lies. You're tired of the corruption. You're tired of people's stupidity and the way they act. You know, anybody ever been there before? Come on. And don't look at anybody if they're here today, if that's who you're thinking of. You're tired of it, and you get you can so easy to get this bitter outlook on life and this just this this terrible out that's the tool of the enemy. That's the tool. He wants to bring you down. 
Friend, we should have the joy of the Spirit flowing through our lives all the time. Because as Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's a win-win for me, amen? And as we heard this morning, if I'm persecuted for Christ, hallelujah. See, when Christ is the sinner, when our hearts are changed, guys, when our hearts are changed, no matter what comes our way, no matter what comes against us, no matter who comes against us, no matter what our nation is going to go through, no matter what our church is going to go through, there's one thing that remains the same. God is still the king of his kingdom. And nothing's going to change that. So we need to come under submission, and as we change our hearts, and we change our attitudes, and we change uh, our purpose of our lives, and God is first on everything, then that hopelessness, that depression, that anger, that sexual immorality begins to fade away, because every day I wake up, it's about God, how can I please you today? God, how can I live for you today? God, how can I witness for you today? Because you're my king and I'm your servant and I love our relationship, Abba Father. Hallelujah. But what does it take to make this happen? What does it take to make this kind of change in our lives? I'm just going to share with you what, I, what I've learned over the years. What I've learned about change, what I've learned, because you know what? How many know men can be pretty thick-headed, amen? Sometimes we need that two-by-four across the backside to to get our attention. And what I've learned in life about change for me probably applies to you. There's four things that I just want to share with you before we close, and it's this. That if we want God to work in our hearts, some things need to happen. But here's some things that don't work. I just want to relieve you of these. Pressure doesn't change your heart. Meaning having a not that any of your wives would do this, but having a nagging wife that puts pressure on you to change, that's not going to change your heart. Only pressure from the Holy Spirit will change your heart, amen? It's called conviction, amen? amen. Know what else won't change your heart is guilt. Oh, man, this is a fun one the devil loves to, power, to pour on you. Guilt, Right? He likes to weigh us down with the guilt of our, of, our, of our sin. He likes to weigh us down with our failures. He, got, he likes to weigh us down with those lies that have been spoken over us. Like you're never going to amount to anything. Like you were a mistake. We weren't even planning on having you. Uh, that coach that said, you know what? You're worthless. Uh, you're never going to be part of this team. Those lies that have been spoken over us or the guilt uh, that comes upon us is never going to change our hearts. But the conviction of the Holy Spirit and when I'm focused on God and saying, God, I want to be, I want to, I'm a chip off the old block and you're my father, so I want to line up. I want to look like you, daddy. I want to talk like you, daddy. I want to think like you, daddy. And it's not guilt, it's, it's conviction. And we take that and we give it to Jesus. And say, change me. You know what else isn't going to leave and, and, and cause change in your heart? Time. People say, well, you know, time heals all wounds. And, and that's true to a certain extent. But you know what? It's not true because there's some wounds in your life that still hurts when you think about it. Mistakes you've made. Here, I'll let him look at you. Mistakes you made. Failures. Struggles. Things that you wish you could do over. Regrets. How many know what I'm talking about? Well, time will heal that. No, but Jesus can heal that. He died for our wounds. He was wounded for our wounds and for our transgressions and for our iniquities. He's our hero, not LeBron James, all right? You know, he's our hero. He's the one that gives us what we need. So guilt and time and pressure, that's not going to change us, friends. Those things won't change us. Those are things of the flesh. But here's what I've learned that changes me. Number one, for me to usually change, I experience pain. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And the old, the old cliche is really true. No pain, what? No gain. And nobody wants pain. Like when you go to the, the foyer in the church, you know, there's small groups. You don't choose the one that says, give me pain, you know. 
it's not like a choice like we sign up Lord just please give me more painful experiences in my life you know I really want to be beat down God I doubt that any of us really have ever prayed that prayer you know what I'm talking about but the, but the change that comes, see, when painful situations happen in our lives, it'll either make us bitter or better. Amen? The choice is ours. And friends, if you have not experienced it yet, which I'm sure you all have, if you have not experienced pain, be ready. You will. Has anybody experienced pain in your life? Let me see your hands. Can I get a witness? All right, yeah. I figured you all do. If not, stay after and we'll beat you up or something, all right? In Jesus' name. None of us wants the pain that causes the change. But when pain comes, it could be pain of divorce, pain of job loss, pain of uh, uh, kids that were once uh, under your protection but now are going the way of the world, you know, pain of uh, infidelity, adultery in your marriage. I mean, dude, we could go down the list, boom, 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 of all the painful situations of, of losing a loved one, losing a kid, losing a spouse. The pain that comes in our lives. But what we need to do is we need to take that pain, and, and, and God's trying to get notice to us, and we need to take it and say, God, I give this to you as an offering. I give this pain to you. What is it in my life that needs to change? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 10, God sometimes uses sorrow in our lives to help us to turn away from sin and to seek eternal life. Anybody been there before? Can I see your hands? Well, you had to learn the hard way. Come on, right? Some of you are still learning the hard way. And God says, listen, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want pain in your life. But the Bible says clearly what? That God will discipline his legitimate children. That there, that there is discipline that comes. There's pain that comes. And sometimes, and it breaks my heart as a pastor and as a brother to see my brothers going through pain after pain after pain, and we've talked about it, and we've prayed about it, but it's because they were, are unwilling to allow God to change them. They're unwilling to give up that sin. Well, God knows how I am. And God knows, you know, he, his mercies are new. Yeah, we can quote all the scripture we want, but it doesn't justify living in disobedience to God. Amen? And when we choose to live in disobedience to God, there's going to be pain. There's going to be pain. And friends, God doesn't want us to have to live that way. God says, though, when pain comes, and it will come, why? Because Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. And friends, can I just say, and I'm not being a negative prophetic word here, but there's more trouble coming in our world. It's getting darker. The good news about the darker it gets, the, the, the brighter our light shines, amen? And the brighter our light shines, the more attack is going to come upon you. I, re I really believe the message for, for pastors to be preaching today and men's leaders to be preaching today isn't, you know, how are we going to get through all this social garbage that's going on. It is that Jesus is returning and it's going to get harder and we're living in the end times. Are you ready? Are you ready to live under persecution are you ready to live when the pain comes are you going to crumble or are you going to stand firm no matter what comes your way and not just for you you're responsible for your wife you're responsible for your children you're responsible for the brothers in your church you're responsible for your community why because god has called you to be a leader man young men Older men, senior men, wherever you fall in that category, you have been called by God to be a leader. And it's when we have that pain in our life and that struggle in our life, we got to decide, what am I going to do with this? Is it gonna, am I going to submit it to God and let it make me better? Or am I going to just let it sit in my heart and make me a bitter, angry a uh, 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 drunkard uh, 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 just cursing like a sailor uh, on the way to church but praising God on Sunday mornings amen you know what I'm talking about oh, what kind of man am I going to be with this pain the second ingredient I believe that God wants to do to help us change is we have to believe that God wants what's best for me even in the pain even in the struggle we got to believe that God wants what's best for me 
I love Isaiah 48, 17. I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way that you should go. Guys, that needs to be part of your thought life every day. It's God's will for my life. It's God's way. And God only has one plan. He doesn't have plan A, plan B, plan C. God has plan A for you. Amen. We're the ones that cause the other plans because we step out of the will of God. And we don't allow that pain. We don't allow that, that conviction. We don't allow what God speaks to us in that mantle or that honor bound or at church on Sunday or reading our devotion. We don't allow that conviction to change us. Instead, we just, like Jonah, we go the opposite way. But friends, when we allow God to take that and believe, my Father has what's best for me, it helps us to live daily lives for Him. I have to admit that phrase, what's best for you, kind of kind of turns me off a little bit because I don't know about you, but oftentimes my parents would say for, to me, uh, Rod, um, this is what's best for you. And usually that meant I'm not going to like it. <laughs> you know, eat the spinach. It's what's best for you. I don't like spinach. Eat it. Clean your plate. Clean your room. You know, mow the grass. You know, don't date this person, this girl. What a, it's what's best for you. You know, and when you, and when you hear that frame, it's what's best for you. Honestly, oftentimes you're like, oh, this isn't going to be good. You know, it's kind of like working out. It's what's best for you, but I'd rather go have a donut. You know what I'm saying? What's best for you? What's best for you? Can I just tell you this? The Word of God says that your Father in heaven has abundant blessings for you that he has an abundant life for you, that he has a plan A for you that will be the greatest adventure you could ever want or desire in your life because he wants what's best for you. Do you believe that, guys? Do you believe that? God knows you better than anyone else, man. He knows inside and out. He knows your thoughts. He knows your actions. He knows where you are, where you've been, where you're going. He knows all about you, and he still is madly in love with you. That's pretty cool, right? So he knows what's best for you. Paul says in Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you what? Trust in him. Friends, you go to God to get hope. You go to God to get peace. You go to God to get assurance. You go to God to get strength. You go to God to get clarity. You go to God to get direction. God has the best in store for you. Then why in the world do we always skip him and say, well, I guess the, all we can do is pray. Why, do we, why is that the last step? Why isn't that the first step? God, uh, we have a job opportunity here. I'm going to fast. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek your face because I know that you have what's best for me. And for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. We have to, we have to believe because Satan wants to rip that away from you. Satan wants you to mistrust God. You know, it began, I don't have time to, to get into the whole story, but it began in the Garden of Eden, right? What did he do? He deceived Eve by twisting God's word and putting an ounce of doubt in her mind. Did God really say that? And that's what he's doing to us today. You know, God really, yeah, did he really say that? And, and can you really trust God? Because remember, he didn't come through for you that one time. Friend, that's all a lie from hell. And we need to believe that through our pain that God has the best for us. If you believe that, say Amen. Here's a third thing that's ingredients that's going to bring change to our heart. And when we have change in our heart, our priorities will change and our lives will change. We need to know God's truth. We need to know God's truth. Proverbs 15, 14, I love this. A wise person is hungry for truth. The fool feeds on trash. Circle truth and circle trash, if you would, please. My question to you is, which one of you, which one are you going to live on, truth or trash? Because it's all around us, friends. It's all around us, truth and trash. And here's the danger. Trash, we're surrounded by trash all the time. 
everywhere, every, every time you turn on the TV, every time you turn on the internet, it's trash, trash, trash. So what does this mean? When the world is full of trash, you got to go after truth. You got to go after truth. Dwayne talked about it. We got to be men of the word. We got to be seek out the truth of what Christ is speaking to us. The trash of entertainment, movies, internet, pornography, dish TV. These are all things that we know about. But friends, guess what? There's other type of trash that has been inputted into our mind. Like when people say, you got to look out for number one. That's not what the Bible says. It says that we are to put others above ourselves. When the world says, you know, whatever decision you make, God just wants you happy. Really, what version is that in? What version is that says, God wants me happy? God wants you holy, and if you're holy, you'll be happy. Come on, man, all right? Well, even when I commit sin, you know, God understands. God hates sin. He doesn't hate you, but he hates sin because it separates you from him. And so there's trash in our lives. There's trash that surrounds us. We need to seek the truth. Proverbs 2, 2 through 5 says, Listen carefully to wisdom. Set your mind on understanding. Cry out for wisdom and beg for understanding. Search for it like silver. Hunt for it like hidden treasure. And then you will understand and respect for the Lord, and you will find that you know God. Friends, that's why you're here today. We want you to know God. We want you to have that relationship. We want you to practice what you believe on a daily basis. Why is truth so important? John 8, 32, you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Say it loud, it'll what? That's why Jesus came, man, to set you free. To set you free from the ideals of this world. To set you free from the lies of that men can't be men. To set you free from the trappings and temptations of this life. That's what Jesus came to do. And so we need to seek the truth above all else. When Pilate asked that question, what is the truth? That's the world, that's what the world is asking. What is the truth? And they're not going to find it in the government, and they're not going to find it in a public education, and they're not going to find it in money, and they're not going to find it in, in 401ks or, or, or career advances. The truth is that Jesus Christ loved you so much that he came to this earth and lived as a man, but died as a savior for our sins. And he rose again and defeated death and hell and sin and has given us the victory to walk in. And when we live that out, every day you should be living victorious. Well, I get depressed and I get down. I get it. The world sucks. But this is in our home. We're going somewhere better, amen? We're citizens of heaven, amen? Here's the last one. I need to learn to do what God says. Matthew 3, 8, do the things that show that you've really changed your hearts and your lives. See, the amazing thing is you could do the other steps, you know. You've got the pain in your life. You could even understand that God has what's best in store for you. And you could even know the truth. And our church is full of men who know the truth. But the last step, the last step is essential. You got to do what it says. You got to live it out. I want you to write in your notes these two words. It's right there. You can write it. One thing. One thing. There's no way you and I can do everything that we know today that God wants to do in our life. But there is one thing you can do. There is one thing you can do. As the worship team prepares, I want to challenge you with this. It's easy for you to write that one thing down. But will you do it? Now let's just be honest. The flesh is weak, right? You can leave here with the best of intentions. But friends, we don't need intentions. We need doers. My challenge to you as we close, I have some next steps for you. Choose today to live for the kingdom of God. It's your choice. We've already been given the opportunity 
to receive Christ, to be filled with the Spirit. But friends, when you walk out these doors of this beautiful church today into the sunshine and you go home to mow your grass or wash your car or, or kick back or whatever you're going to do, you need to choose today whom you're going to serve. Because if you don't, then you've already answered the question. He said, man, you're being hard on me because I love you. And we need men of God that are sold out, chosen, choosing to serve the kingdom of God first. And guess what? When you do that, all these other things, God's got it. Come on, are you with me? When we choose him first, all the other things of life, God's got it. See, this is where the priority part comes in. Because when I choose God first, my schedule is going to free up. My, my, my things that keep me down are going to go away. The things that prevent me from being the warrior and the soldier of God and the adventurer and the rescuer of beauty, uh, the, those, things, those things are going to burst to the fourth for God's glory. But I got I to gotta choose that the kingdom of God is number one. Number two, ask God to change your heart. I dare you. I double dog dare you. I smiley face dare you. Ask God to change your heart. And he will. Say, God, give me one thing. Give me one thing that you want me to work on as your kid. And let it change your whole life, your whole system, your whole priority list. Then lastly, I gave you a devotional by Patrick Morley. I remember Man in the Mirror back in the day. This is the practical step. Do this this weekend. Walk through this, because this gives you more of the idea of how do I set my priorities in line with God? Why don't you stand with me? I want to pray over you. We're going to worship the Lord. And take little smiley face squeezy with you. Set it somewhere where you can see it as a reminder. This is how God looks at you. He looks at you with a huge smile on his face. He is pleased with you. He is proud of you as his son. He loves you. He's got great plans for you. But we got to do it his way because he's our king. Amen. Amen. Father God, you are great and awesome and mighty and holy. Lord, we love to worship you. It's been great to be in your presence today. It's been great, God, to be known, reminded that we are sons of the living God, that we are called with a purpose, created on purpose, for a purpose. So God, today, as we close out with worship, Lord, receive it as a sweet incense into your nostrils. Lord, receive our praise. God, we will commit to doing the one thing. We'll commit to putting your kingdom first. We'll commit to saying yes to you. You're our Savior. You're our God. You're everything to us. Help us to live it out this week, this month, this summer, this year. Change us from the inside out. Set our priorities to be your priorities, oh God. We can't do without you. So send us your Holy Spirit and change us. We love you. And all of God's men said amen. 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 Let's worship God. Amen. The Mentor Guy's final thought. What an inspiring challenge for God's men. I hope this message today challenged you to take the lessons and apply it to your life. I hope it helped you where you're at today so you can move forward into a deeper walk with God. But guys, we're out of time for this week. So before we go, would you remember to take a second to give us a five-star review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, and Google Play? And also remember we're available on Amazon Music and Spotify. Also, don't forget, you can find all about our Mantor conferences, our dates, our locations, our speakers, everything you need to know at MantorMinistries.com. MantorMinistries.com also has information of all of our books, our resources. You can read the first chapter of almost all of our books. There are for free. And you can also check out our monthly newsletter there. There's so much information and resources available for you at MantorMinistries.com. I encourage you, check it out. Visit the website today. But guys, we're out of time for this week. So once again, thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next week on the Mantor Guy Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Be sure to visit MantorMinistries.com to learn more about our books, men's ministry resources, and our Mantor conferences.
Have you been looking for a Bible study that you can work through with your wife? Maybe you want to do devotional time with your daughter. Guys, we have the answer for you. You can buy both the men's and women's edition of Whatever It Takes for $15. This amazing deal is only available at our Mantor Ministries online store. If you go to Amazon, it is $14.99 for just the men's version. So many men are buying both versions and going through them with their wives and daughters. Do not miss this opportunity. Take advantage of this amazing deal today at MantorMinistries.com and click on the online store button. Order your copy today at MantorMinistries.com. Before we go, guys, one last thing. We did talk about it in a podcast, but if you sign up with Covenant Eyes at CovenantEyes.com and you use the code MANTOR when you check out, you can receive one month of free service. Guys, what do you got to lose? You can try for 30 days, see how great it is, see how helpful it is to your walk with God. I guarantee you, you're not going to want to get rid of it. You're going to love it. So I try it, protect yourself, protect your family, and raise up a standard against the enemy as he is trying to attack you and your loved ones. So I covenant eyes for free, for free for 30 days using the code MANTOR, it's M-A-N-T-O-U-R, at CovenantEyes.com. Try it today, guys. What do you got to lose? The Mantor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God.